I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com, and here today with me is Mark Walbert, founder of Contrarian Codex, or you may know him by his Twitter handle, which is yellowbull11. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's a very exciting time for uranium and nuclear power as well. Yes, I'm really excited to be talking to you again during this exciting time. But before we get started, since it is our first time talking, I wondered if you could start with just a quick introduction to yourself, your work, and maybe what first got you interested in the uranium sector. I got interested in uranium a few years ago. What really got me interested is just the fact that I was looking for an investment thesis that had was completely unlawed. So I guess you could call it from a contrarian perspective. But when I looked into uranium, what I found was a very, very unloved, even hated sector. When I first started writing about it and sharing it, I got a lot of hate coming away. I also got a lot of very good questions from people who didn't even know that you could invest in uranium. But that was paired with a lot of hate as well. So I knew I was looking in the right place. And what I found was a commodity that was facing a major supply demand gap as well as just in general uh, the equities being completely beaten down but what i also found was that uranium was completely necessary for all the nuclear power plants that we are running in the world and that nuclear power was especially at that time contrary to popular belief still a growth industry it was not a great growth industry growing at about like 1.5 to 2 percent a year but it was a growth industry nonetheless so i knew we needed more uranium and at that point that between like an 18 and 25 dollar um price per pound it wasn't really incentivizing a lot of new production it was even bringing some production offline so at that point i started looking into the sector and i'm sure we're going to get into this as well but the thesis at that point that got me interested and excited for this uranium bull market it has just gotten upgraded like 15 times over the past few years it is absolutely incredible so that is what got me interested in it. And that's what I also based my platform, the Petroleum Codex, and my Twitter account, Yellowbull 11 on, where I interview very smart people in this space, uh, companies, experts, analysts, and also do write-ups and newsletters. Um, of course, we're also based on other commodities and a bit of macro as well. But my main focus is, and always has been, uranium, because try as I might, I really haven't been able to find another investment opportunity that comes close to the fundamentals that uranium offers. Okay, really interesting to hear your background and definitely the thesis has progressed since you first came into the space, it sounds like. So I know a lot of people when they're looking at where we're at in the uranium cycle, they like to consider it in terms of innings. So nine innings in a baseball game, for example, and we're in the second inning or the third inning. You have a different way of looking at it, which I found pretty interesting, and it's it's the stadium model. So I wondered if you could explain where we're at in the uranium cycle in those terms. Uh, yes, the uranium stadium model. It is a model that I, when I first got started, I wanted to like visualize or perhaps like use an analogy to explain to people, okay, where are we in the cycle um, without like being too like convoluted or overly complicated so being from the netherlands i didn't really go with baseball i went with you might call it soccer i call it football um the building of a stadium so what this means is that i use 2016 to 2020 as kind of the range where the stadium was built this is where the like the basis for the investment thesis um is being built setting up for the game at hand so in 2016 the price of uranium bottomed and then through 2016 towards 2020 you saw the thesis like the basing of the thesis being laid the foundations being put in place for this stadium then i used 2021 as the timeline for when the buses would arrive so when the bus would arrive means that more people come to the sector it gets more attention uh, there's more capital flowing in in the end that is also what ended up happening because at the end of 2020 up to November 2021, we saw a lot more capital coming in. We saw, of course, Sprott coming in as well. We saw a lot more retail investors being interested as well. And after that, you, of course, wait for the game to start. People take their places. People buy a hot dog, buy a beer, whatever you know, the draw if you've ever been to a, uh, to any sports game in a stadium, for that matter. But that kind of coincided with a correction as people waited for the game. I, I signaled that as the 2021 
through 2022 type of time period. And then the game begins. And what I mean with the game beginning is that is when the correction is over and you really see more and more capital flowing. And I feel like the first half of this game is now well underway. We broke $60, which was kind of a line in the sand because a lot of people were viewing that, uh, especially a few years ago, as kind of the equilibrium price level. I don't agree with that anymore. I think the equilibrium price level for uranium is now close to $85 to $90. But this was kind of the line in the sand. That $60 to $65 range. That is where most people are keeping an eye on. Well, after the WNA, we absolutely sliced through it. And at the time of recording, we were at $72.5 per pound. So price momentum has certainly kicked in. And I think that right now we are moving towards uh, the second half. But of course, before we get to the second half, there is always a halftime break. And the reason I want to mention this halftime break is because given prevailing macro circumstances and also because Saturn is very bullish in uranium right now. I think we could see some form of correction in the near term just so equities can have something of a brief or maybe if we see a broad equities market correction because this is still a considered a, risk, a risky asset class and also being relatively illiquid and small, I think that some of the wind can get knocked out of the sails of in particular the equities. I don't think the price of physical uranium, re, sorry, uranium has a lot of downside. Um, but the equities could certainly take a brief or how bad that brief will be, I don't know. But that could be halftime. And I think halftime could be Q4 of this year. But after that, 2024, as I noted in the stadium model that I um, that I constructed years ago, as one well, I shared with everybody that was, uh, that was following me at the time, the second half, I think, will blow the first half out of the water. And the second half, I think, consists of two parts. I think it moves into 2024, perhaps also 2025. And then you have the bulk of the second half is when the institutional capital comes in. You see more retail investors coming in. That's when you see the bulk of the price move. Then you have the final few minutes. And I flag the final few minutes as a time where you really don't want to stick around, especially not with your entire portfolio still running on the game at hand because... Maybe you want to get out before the traffic jam happens. Maybe before you want to get out before any final minute disappointment. But in the final few minutes, that is where you see the like the real parabolic top happening. Like maybe you're running up 20 or 30% even more. And if you leave before the final few minutes, yes, it is not going to be great. And yes, other people are going to enjoy the last part of the game just a little bit more than you perhaps did. But at that point, you're going to have to take your profits because... When the final whistle goes and everybody goes to leave the stadium, everybody is stuck in a traffic jam, whatever else happens, that is when the backside of that chart that went so parabolically to the upside is just as steep on the downside. So don't risk it. You're going to miss the top. Just like at the start of this thesis, a lot of people miss the absolute bottom. That is just the way that the, that the markets work. It's just the way that the investment thesis is going to work. So... I would scale out the tranches and I would not leave a lot on the table for the final few minutes. So that is basically the stadium model. And after that, the stadium probably gets uh, torn down again and we start building another stadium for another commodity. Okay, I think that gives us a good idea of where we are and where you see us going. You mentioned a lot of points, but one of the ones that I want to follow up on is the WNA event that happened, I think a couple of weeks ago at this point, but still really important to go over. So you wrote, I believe, a 60-page report, many over 60 pages for your followers. Definitely, that's beyond the scope of this interview. But I wanted to ask you about that. And if you had to pull out one or two takeaways from that WNA event that you wanted investors to know about, what would they be? I would say that there are a few things that I took from the WNA. First of all, when I was walking through the halls of the WNA event, one thing that really struck me is that People were just very positive. Uh, a lot of people that were going through these events years back in the bear market that were nuclear power was not really having the positive um, like feedback loop that it is that it finds itself there right now. People were definitely a lot more negative a few years ago. Where right now, everyone was saying, everybody's so positive, everybody's so bullish. So that is definitely a sign of the times and a sign that we are really getting into some very positive momentum for both uranium as well as nuclear power. And the second one I would say is that utilities are really waking up now. 
And that's not just coming from me, it's also coming from the utilities themselves. The two main quotes that I took from the event, one being from a fuel buyer, one being from the largest nuclear power operator in the US being Constellation Energy. I'll start with that one. They sat on stage at a panel when a nuclear fuel report was shared and Constellation Energy noted that utilities should not be dependent going forward on inventory drawdown and or secondary supply because inventories have been drawn down for a long, long time and that age of inventory overhang is over as was reported by one of the largest uranium price reports in the space last year. And the second part for with regards to secondary supply, that is also faltering. This year, we are looking at between 15 and 17 million pounds of secondary supply. That is half of what it was a few years ago. So that means that utilities, but also other entities can't rely on that as a source of secondary supply anymore. So they know that, that utilities should be focused more on primary supply, which is where contracting comes in, which is where also the major part of the price discovery comes in. The second quote that I want to share comes from a fuel buyer. And when I was speaking with him, he noted, I asked him, so, okay, with inventory drawdowns now being over and even inventory restocking being on the horizon because inventory is probably pro-cyclical uh, in an upwards price movement. I asked him, so with that being the case and with secondary supply being where it is, what do you make of the current way that you are viewing this uh, supply demand gap? And he noted to me that over the past 10 years, there was never really any question whether there was supply available or not. He always mentioned that there was no really worry because supply always came from somewhere. And then he followed that up with, but somewhere has dried up. So the fact that he, and a fuel buyer here noted that this somewhere has dried up really tells you all you need to know about where this market is going. So I think that people at the WNA are really waking up to that reality right now. And I think that's that was reflected um, in price as well because we saw some RFPs coming in. We're still seeing more RFPs coming, I believe four or five more. The utilities will be looking for five million pounds each over the coming year. So that's definitely something to look forward to. There's even an RFP out for January for a healthy amount of uranium. So that is all near-term demand. And I think that the WNA has really uh, woken some people up, so to speak. I think the third one uh, would also be the reality that the price needs to go a lot higher to incentivize new production. What we're looking at right now, as I alluded to earlier in our chat, is that equilibrium price level is closer to $85, $90 right now. So what that means is that we still have a long way to go to even get to that point, after which we likely see a price spike. Because in these commodity cycles, and I always say the same thing, and if I sound like a broken record here because people... Because of, if people listen to my interviews more often, I always note this, that these commodity prices, because they're so cyclical, they never stop at equilibrium price level. They go through it on the downside in the bear market. They go through it to the upside in the bull market. So I think we will see the same thing happen again. And I think the supply response uh, will be muted. Uh, a lot of people that I spoke with on the WNA are were very positive. Okay, if the price goes up, we'll see a lot more supply coming online. But my research is pointing to that not being the case. I think the combination of a lack of supply chain or sorry, a lack of supply being available for such as material, but also uh, for also workforce, supply chain issues to get that material there, transportation issues, but also a profound lack of intellectual capital for people that actually know how to build a uranium mic because these things are very complex. So with all that being in place, I think a supply response, even at much higher prices, will take time to come online, which means that prices likely will go much higher for much longer. So those were the main things that I took from the WNA. Overall, a very positive event. Okay, thank you for, for going through that with us. So I'm going to come back to price, but first I want to ask you a follow-up question on supply. So. It's really clear from speaking to you, speaking to others, that there's a real supply crunch going on in uranium, which is good for prices, good for equities. But I'm wondering, you know, if we have a real bottleneck in supply develop, I'm starting to think in the back of my mind, does that put in danger the the goodwill that has developed for nuclear power? You know, everybody's really excited about this as a source of fuel. But if we come to a time when it's really so hard to get uranium, does that pose a problem 
you think that and you would be right uh for think that if the price would stay where it is now or even a few dollars lower we would definitely be facing more supply chain or sorry supply issues going forward and there has definitely been some issues for example with the sanctions on russia what the west is doing right now they are trying to replace that uh, fuel cycle capacity that russia brought with it by bringing online uh, things like confordine uh canadian uh, supply as well on that end also if france or renault is looking to expand their resume conversion capacity the uk is looking to do the same Urenco in Netherlands is looking to do the same. So the West is definitely trying to make their own secure supply chain for nuclear fuel in that regard. But every um, every commodity that is looking at a supply demand gap, it usually 95% of the time, and that also fits with uranium this time, it's not a 5% uh, of the time where it doesn't get fixed, it gets fixed by price. High prices are the cue for high price. I'm sure a lot of the listeners listening to this have heard that mantra a hundred times before, but that's because it's true. As uranium gets to a high enough price, there are plenty of projects out there that will be very, very profitable. They will be brought online, even with that lack of intellectual capital, even with those delayed due to supply chain issues, they will be brought online because they are simply profitable enough for shareholders to invest in these projects and for teams to go out and make sure that they, they develop these projects. Uranium is not scarce. It is just hard to get by at certain prices. So once the price gets high enough, it will incentivize new production. It will incentivize new CapEx production, what we have lacked so much over the past decade of. Um, so yeah, there is definitely supply issues right now and the supply demand cap is getting close to a supply demand chasm in my opinion. But that is nothing that a price and time can fix. So I think that we will be just fine as long as the price gets to a well enough incentive price for high enough, for long enough to make sure that that supply actually goes to the market for the end users. Okay, that does make me feel better. And that takes us back to price. So I think people who are watching the Iranian market, they are pretty used to seeing the price do nothing. In the last several years, they've been used to seeing prices slowly creep higher. But now it feels like we're getting to a point where we could see prices rise higher much more quickly. And I wonder for you, so you've talked a little bit about what you see coming for prices, but do you see, I think one of the debates out there is if we're going to see a price spike or we go way, way up. So do you see that happening? And what could be the catalyst if that does happen? Well, I would say that my base case scenario, when we talked about the stadium model, when I when I first created that one, I was not I was bang I was banking on some sort of price spike, but not a momentous one like I'm expecting right now. So what I mean by that, so my expectation was always a robust price move to the upside, steady as she goes, to 80, 90, 95, and then perhaps a blow off top. Right now, I think a parabolic price spike is the right way to look at this. And I think that has blown my base case scenario, especially after the DOBNA out of the water. So we talked about supply, we talked about demand. And I think that those two factors, given the way that they have been developing right now, and also given the prevailing circumstance for what we're seeing right now, are already enough to see a price spike happen. The reason that I want to preempt that with the word potentially parabolic it's because of the financial entity started in this space. A lot of you also will have already known of the Sprott Fiscal Uranium Trust. Well, if they see a lot more flows again, like they did in 2021 and they started 2022, they will be buying a lot more pounds and they will be buying a lot more pounds in a fiscal market that is increasingly getting tighter and a lot more tight than it was at the time when they were first started buying pounds because they unwound the carry trade that is not here anymore to really um, act as like a price cap. So they will go into a much more liquid market. But here is the catch. They won't be alone. They will have the ANU fund that will also be looking for pounds. They will have Yellow Cake PLC out of London. They will have the PFYN Capital Group out of Singapore, which has a line of sight at racing, from what I've heard, between four and $500 million as well to stack pounds with great advisors on the board and a great structure of the fund where we should get more information about soon. 
And one of the advisors is Aska Batibayov, a uh, former Casalpom CCO. Well, actually, we'll be interviewing next month for the Codex, so that will, should be made for a very informative chat. But for all this capital, and there are even two or three more uh, new capital groups that, or financial entities rather, that should come online in the coming months uh, to the tune of between 75 and 125 billion dollars each. And then of course, you also have Zuri Invest. Where she also raised a let's call it a pretty penny to stack pounds as well. So you have all these financial entities as well as not a few hedge funds that are looking to play a part in this market. And if they deliver on their potential, or God forbid, if they overperform their potential, there will really be a massive price spike because there is simply not enough supply available to really absorb this massive flow of these hundreds of millions perhaps even billions of dollars if we really see capital flows coming in. So I think that is where you get the possibility of a parabolic price spike. And where that ends, I don't know. I've seen people talk about 200, 250, 300, even $500 uranium. Could that happen? Anything is possible. I'm not necessarily banking on it. I'm taking this thing one step at a time and looking at it in a very conservative manner just to make sure that my downside is also protected. But when looking at upside potential, throwing conservative uh, conservatism out of the window, I think we have, we still have a long way to go. And I think a parabolic price spike is has become more likely than not given prevailing circumstances. Okay, so again, you've given us a really good picture of what the landscape looks like right now. And as we're finishing up, I want to ask a question that I think is fun to ask. So we'll see how it goes. I'm wondering what you think the most misunderstood aspect of the uranium market is right now, given that this, mar this is a market that is pretty hard to understand sometimes. I think there are three things that we can discuss in this regard. I think one of the things that is underestimated at this point is the impact that SMRs could have on this uranium bull market as well as just nuclear in general. Because SMRs are viewed as something, oh, that's going to be something for the next decade. It's going to be something that impacts the next bull cycle. But I think it impacts this bull cycle as well, and I can make a pretty good bet that it will, because um, at off air we talked about it. You spoke with Justin as well. Well, uh, so I think it was a month ago that Justin he posted about a SMR RFP for uh, fuel already being out this year into the market, which tells you that demand is coming down the pipeline. So I think he's going to be spot on with that. That SMR demand is in nobody's models right now. It's not in my model. I wouldn't know how much demand exactly comes in. So being conservative, I'm going to leave it out of my model, but I know a lot of people are also doing the same thing. And I think that having spoke to a few SMR companies at the WNA as well, I think that demand will start to trickle into the market and gain momentum as this bull market goes on to 2024, 2025, perhaps even 2026. And that is additional demand that is, again, as I just mentioned, it's not being modeled in right now, so that could have an impact. Uh, the second one I would say is that when people talk about a uranium bear case, besides your usual, um, oh, is it nuclear accident, it's going to be bad for the market, of course, that's that's the main bear case a lot of people uh, will first have on their minds when you ask them for a bear case. Another one is that um, the Chinese could throw their inventory on the market to suppress the price. Depending on who you speak with, depending on the math you use, they have between 400 and 450 million pounds. Maybe more, maybe less, but roughly that ballpark is, I think, is a good estimate. Um, so between four, 400 and 450 million pounds. And could they throw this on the market? Again, anything is possible. But given that they are focusing on building out their nuclear reactor fleet to be by far the biggest in the world over the coming decades, they have always taken a view of like a multi decade view of energy security. And I would be very surprised if they throw this on the market because. Perhaps for their current fleet, that 400 to 450 million pounds may seem like a lot, but for their proposed fleet, it really isn't. And I would argue that given the Chinese, they are already in the tour market right now and they're looking for pounds together with a myriad of other entities as well as we discussed. Um, I would argue they are more likely to add to their inventories rather than throw them on the market. Maybe once we really get a clear sight of supply coming online, that's going to change. But that is not here right now. So I think that this is definitely misunderstood as people that just label this as a bear case. 
I think the third one can also kind of be labeled as a bear case, but it's again coming back to that intellectual capital, coming back to those timelines. People are expecting a lot of supply to come online once we get to that 80 or that 90 or that triple digit level or however high we may go in this bull market. That supply, it takes time. There are some deposits out there that have hundreds of millions of pounds in the ground. But pounds in the ground aren't really worth much if you can't get them out. And of course, you need the right price, but you also need a lot of times these things take 5, 10, 15 years to be brought online. So that's definitely something to take into account. Um, yeah, so don't underestimate the, how the supply response can be slower. And as we've already seen from brownfield restarts and also from existing producers, projects don't always come online on time. They don't always come online on budget. And when they come online, they can face issues. If even the largest and best producers in the world, think Casana, Prom, and Chemical, face their own issues, um, these jury miners will face issues as well. And I want to add actually one more thing. I said I would do three, but I'm going to add one more. WNA also spoke with some of the largest transporters of Class 7 material, which also, of course, includes uranium. And they noted that there were a lot of transportation issues. After in my 60 page report, I also dedicated part of it to these transportation issues. And I highlighted the Trans-Caspian routes that gone through the Caspian Sea, through Azerbaijan, Georgia, into the Black Sea and towards the West as a potential um, additional piece of uh, transportation issues. And uh, in a few weeks after, like we have just seen some Conflict has been flaring up between Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, which also could have an effect on this trans caspian route as well. So these transportation issues are widespread, and it kind of feels like whack-a-mole. That's the analogy that one of these guys used, that when you squash one, there's another transportation issue just waiting around the corner to pop its head up. So that is something that also adds um, to just the entire thesis that we're discussing. Okay, this has been really informative and I've kept you a little bit longer than I intended to. Just before I do let you go, I'll ask if you have any final thoughts for the audience right now or if you just want to share a reminder on where people can find you online if they want to learn more from you. Oh, thank you for having me. It was a great chat and I would say that it is good for people to absolutely be bullish because the fundamentals are amazing but also to be wary of any broad market influence or any uh, briefers, as you would call it, after such a strong, nearly just vertical run-up for some equities. So keep that in mind, but over the coming months and years, the setup is just absolutely incredible. And as I start, said at the start of the interview, I really can't find anything that has the same fundamental setup. So if you want to come along for this ride, yeah, you can find me at patreon.com slash contrarian codex, where I have sample portfolios for uranium and also other commodities, a spreadsheet that holds all the best commodity or all the best uranium companies in the space, including management team rating, resources, NPV, performance, um, as well as regular interviews with, for example, Oscar Batibayev, but also other companies that were experts in the space. So if you want to join the community, it's great. Others bring a lot of value to it as well. It's always great to have more people on for the ride. And if you were to find me on Twitter, you can find me at Yellowbull11. Okay, perfect. Really, really a wealth of information out there with you. So thank you so much for coming on to talk to us about what's going on in your rating right now. This is really great. Thank you as well. Of course. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with InvestingNews.com. And this is Mark Walbert with Contrarian Codex. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.